Now, on to the more important topic of today, which are, what I, have I learned from taking this class? What are you supposed to learn? Uh, uh, what does this class really bring to you? Uh, it certainly doesn't bring to, to you a well-defined set of rules that if you follow those rules, uh, A, B, and C, then you will get D, a successful company. There's no formulas. This is unlike m many of your classes which give you information that if you reliably follow it, you will reliably get a result. Business is not that way. Uh, and so bi business is more about uh, unpredictability, about chaos, and from being in this class since 1976, I've had a chance to see lots of people come and go and lots of presentations like you've seen so far. And from being a, a student here in this class, I have developed my 15 rules to simplify what I think I have learned from this class about the true character of startup companies. Um, the, the first and most important rule is there are no magic rules of thumb. Uh, perhaps it seems strange that the first rule says there are no rules, <laughs> but uh, that is simply the way, way it is. There's lots of unpredictability, lots of chaos. Conditions vary. Your mileage may vary too in, in pursuing a company. In, in lots of ways, uh, the per pursuit of the entrepreneur I found to be similar to that of Wiley Coyote, who, who uh, uh, as a practice, looked into the Acme cookbook as to how to catch uh, that bird, uh, beep, beep. Uh, but actually, he frequently found himself disappointed in the results. Most entrepreneurs fail, in fact, uh, s several times before they succeed. In, in fact, one of our speakers said that success is an, an anomaly in a string of failures. The good things happen when, when your failures are s small and your success is big. Uh, same is true for Mr. Coyote. A temporary monopoly is a most important asset to start starting a company. Especially if you're an EE or a CS student, you have an opportunity to create something that no one else has ever made before and probably doesn't have the foggiest idea how to do. You have a a unique opportunity as a result of your Stanford experience to create a monopoly. No monopoly lasts forever, so hence a temporary monopoly as others try and reproduce what you have done. And eventually, with enough time, you will lose part or all of your monopoly. But it's very helpful at first when you're a small company that you're the only one in the world that can provide whatever it is your company provides. Uh, that ability to, to provide something that's truly unique helps greatly when it comes time to try and sell whatever it is. Large companies don't like to buy from individuals or small companies. Large companies will buy from small companies if they can't buy it any other way. There are two uh, characteristic times to start a company, I found. Uh, one time is more or less straight from school or soon after school. You're young, you don't have a lot of uh, entanglements, you have free time, you can start a company. The other 
uh, kind of company is formed by people who are almost 50 years old and have worked for three or four companies and have considerable experience. And it's something from that experience that they take as their secret sauce to uh, help them start a company. They, they discover something that, that they see that everyone else is doing it the wrong way, they fix it, and they do it what they think is the right way. And usually they have a bigger, more, more professional team. Usually they have more investment and a larger VC participation. My fifth rule is that business success may come at the expense of family success, particularly for those who start a company late in life. If you start a company out of school, you probably aren't married yet. And if you are thinking about being married, it, it will all, all be done in, at the same time in the context of a, a startup company. However, those late bloomer uh, entrepreneurs who start with a wife and kids when they're almost 50 may have had a long career where, where they spent more time paying attention to their children and more time at home. And when they form a company, they find that the obligations of the company are hard to fulfill and also fulfill all of their historic family obligations. <clears throat> it, uh, my sixth rule is that exposure to peer entrepreneurial experiences is a key motivational factor for ma many company founders. It's very hard to be in, in the middle of Utah and form a high-tech company that's successful. There's a lot of things that go on in the formation of a company and being in and around other people who are doing the same thing can be extremely helpful. There are now a, a series of groups or companies that call themselves incubators, which are just large buildings of people comprised of multiple startup companies who are all sharing some uh, thing w with their fe fellow uh, 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 entrepreneurs and, and also doing their own thing as well. So being in and around company found founders can be very helpful in trying to start a company. Through the years, uh, uh, it, it's been apparent that differentiation of products from, from, from the competition and uh, a clear definitions of the segments of uh, uh, bi business or markets that pro products are part of are quite important. Uh, it is important to have a clear uh, uh, reason why people should buy what, what it is you have to sell and how what you have to sell is clearly different than what other people are trying to sell. Founders of successful com companies uh, do not come from any particular academic standards. Uh, you may be a Stanford student, good for you. You may have a, 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 a plus average. That's good for you, good for Stanford. It doesn't really uh, predict how successful you're going to be uh, in for, forming a small company. Uh, it's uh, not unheard of that a, a C student might be quite successful. Success in business does not directly track with your academic success. Uh, 
I think that it's, it's uh, uh, not uh, that surprising. Uh, uh, there are people who are extremely successful in, in taking and passing tests and, and doing schoolwork, which someone else con conceives of and assigns. It's something else to go out uh, on your own and invent something from scratch. Successful entrepreneurs try lots of different things. It's, it's, this rule is perhaps the most important rule in, in, in my, my world of no rules, but what is most important is to try lots of different things, to, to not be just stuck in one direction. Try things, assess how well they work, and then change them. Try and change. Try seven things, keep the best two, and then continue. Uh, you will never have complete information. You will never know which will be successful. So having the ability to keep multiple irons in the fire and try experimentally lots of different things is a key to success. Sometimes this e even gets into the technology. For, for instance, it's no real big secret that Google tried different uh, uh, customer screens with di different people who were u using their system. And then they would do experiments with their customers to evaluate which of the ma ma many different approaches to a solution they found the best for their customers. It may be easier to create a, a good product when you're also a customer for, for that product. If you create something that's, that's good, you believe, for, say, old people, and you aren't an old person, you may not have good judgment with regard to what old people really want. If you are trying to create something for s someone else, it's not as e easy to optimize as if it is f something that you would like to own and use yourself. Hard work and good ideas are essential, but in ma many cases, e even the best of plans uh, require luck to make them successful. <clears throat> One of the most difficult things to do is in uh, attracting customers. It's very important to attract lots of good customers. Uh, however, uh, lots of people, when they're pla planning a company, do not talk to co customers until very late in the development cycle. This is a big, big mistake. You should go out and talk to customers early and frequently and show them prototypes and be obnoxious in wor working your way in uh, to places where cu customers are to get their real world feedback. Talking to customers early is very important. The most uh, frequent reason why new companies fail is no one wants what they built. They built something they thought was awesome and no one wants it. And why? Because they didn't talk to people. Be ca cautious about how you divide up your company. If you have your five best friends and, and you're out at the Oasis drinking beer one night, don't f form your company there where it's formed by five companies, each with an 
equal one-fifth share. It's almost certain that a company with five equal founders will fail because you will be married to those people for a very long time. And uh, the more there are, the more difficult it is. Perhaps one partner, maybe in some rare, rare cases, two partners. But keep the number of founders small. Few successful uh, companies experience success without setbacks. Don't expect your company to rocket up like Snapchat and be worth thir 35 times your sales after four years. That just doesn't happen and it won't happen to you. It happens to the other guy. <laughs> Uh, this is like in Las Vegas where they have a big uh, horn and when someone w wins a slot machine, the whole room knows that there was a slot machine winner. However, there are a thousand other people in that room who, who didn't win a slot machine who are watching. That's very similar to the way the rest of the world works. It will always be someone else. So you cannot count on uh, the fact that, that your company is simply going to be an instant success. <laughs> be prepared for a bunch of failure before you succeed. The real world is far more stochastic than deterministic. You have been trained for years and years and years that there are things like Maxwell's laws, Ohm's law. With Ohm's law, if you stick a voltage on, you get a current. Everyone knows that. It works. You go into the lab, you test it, it works. Ohm's law it is actually not a law. It doesn't always work. If you buy a commercial resistor, it works, but if you Try lots of things that, that can vary in temperature as you pass current through them. They'll vary in resistance uh, as a function of time and the current. So they'll get hot, and when they get hot, the resistance will either soar or go down. There's both kinds. <laughs> uh, the resistance might go up, the resistance might go down, but they definitely don't follow Ohm's law. Ohm's law is a myth. It's an Ohm's, Ohm's conjecture. Maxwell's laws also only work in a linear kind of world. In a non-linear world where there are extreme fields, things get weird. And, and Maxwell's well, laws need extension. <laughs> Why do founders of Startups think they fail. This is a very important chart. I'm going to email everyone in the class these slides, so don't worry about exactly these details. But there, there's a slide here with, which gives you the top 25 reasons, top 20 reasons, why people think their recently failed company failed. What is the number one reason? It's what I said, no market need. What is the number two reason? Ran out of cash. And what was the number three reason? Not the right team. <laughs> uh, these are important things, and, and, and I can sit here and say them. You, you say, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, it's not easy to apply these rules. You have to think about them all day and all night, worry about everyone forever to succeed in a company. What do the f founders get? Uh, they get equity, and, and you say, yeah, I like that part. Uh, they, they, they get to make uh, important company decisions. Now, I think actually as a prior founder of a company, I think that the equity part 
doesn't make you feel good for a long, long time. Being able to make decisions might make you feel good on a daily basis because you don't have to uh, have someone that you don't respect making the decisions that you don't agree with. You get to make every decision you want to make. But you also get, if it works, pride and accomplishment. Of course, if it doesn't work, you really, really feel bad. You definitely learn more about people and about the world. You become much craftier and much more aware of what other people do and think after you form your own company. You get smarter. Not, not smart, perhaps, in the way you have learned in Stanford EE classes. Smart in the way of the world. Some of you, if you're successful with your company, will become well known. Now, I personally don't think that's a good thing. I don't want to be well known. Being well known means that people bug you and uh, make you a target. You walk around with a target uh, on your back. There's also this kind of question uh, since t t today's the second day of the Snapchat uh, uh, experience, uh, th there's a question of, well, if you form these companies with lots of shares, how much do you end up with after going public? And I looked all over for all kinds of information about this top topic, but I discovered that it varied enormously depending upon the company, who the investors were, and what the history of the company was after going public. However, a few years ago, KPMG, that's a consulting company, did a detailed analysis of a hundred Silicon Valley startup companies. And they observed that the sweat equity founders of the company at, at the time just after going public had 19% of the company. That is a lot. 19% of a public company is worth a lot. The rest of the employees had around 19% too. And the various investors had 62%. Of course, you had just gone public. Part of what those investors are is pu public investor people, but there were lots of uh, investors involved prior to going public. How risky it, is it to start a typical technology company? Again, this is a chart which varies all over the place. So I give you my favorite KPMG chart. It's all their fault if you think this is wrong. But essentially, they uh, conclude that 20% of startup companies have above average returns, <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> and 60% have below average returns. So 20% are, are winners, 60% are real losers. So, I've given you my rules, you're empowered. You obviously want to ask me, should, should you start a company? And I say no, <laughs> don't do it. Don't start a company, you heard me say it. And my answer is yes, only if saying no <laughs> will not deter you. If you're gonna do it, sure, do it. But don't do it because I say it's a good thing to do. It has lots of problems, you're going to suffer. I've had students who have gone out and done it and failed two or three times. Come back just 
absolutely exhausted, broke. They come back to thank me. I, some of them I was afraid of, you know, that, that they might be a little angry. Uh, they don't all hit home runs instantly. But somehow they, they all seem to have good spirit. I haven't met an angry one yet, but I don't look forward to the day. Now, you may have forgotten, and I'm just repeating it to remind you, there was the question of the monopoly. You need a monopoly. Don't do it without some sense of what your monopoly is. So the question is, how the heck do you get a monopoly? And the uh, uh, question doesn't have an easy answer, and it's not a question to which I can gi give you a simple an answer to. Every new technology or direction has like this fog of information, and different people report different things about the same topic area. We have autonomous cars. If you read, read the papers, you would believe that every car will be driving itself within three years. Well, I'll take bets. <laughs> uh, but certainly there will be something in three years. There will be different partial answers. Different people will come up with different approaches. Probably the complete problem won't be solved for at least four years. <laughs> May, maybe much longer than that. But uh, there are lots of different approaches to the same problem. But you have to find one, and, and you have to find your, your direction, which is unique. <clears throat> and so it, it m might be coming up in your mind that can, can we possibly build something that we don't uh, understand? And uh, I give you a quote from Dogbert who said that nobody would try anything new if they understood all the consequences. Therefore, all progress is based upon faulty assumptions. This is very true. But despite that, it happens. People are successful. But the reasons they're successful were not always the exact reasons that they thought going in. There's lots of new waves of, of exciting things coming out. Biochips, cloud apps, nanotech, virtual worlds, 3D. <laughs> greenhouse gas stuff. Uh, success in each of these areas will be from being in the right position when, when that wave hits. I think you're going to have a very hard time to try and reproduce the successes of the past by using the techniques of the past. Social networks have been done. Mark Zuckerberg solved that problem. Uh, Google did search. Try something new. Find a different approach or wrinkle. And, and then be in, in position before that, that approach is viable and hits big. One of the pro problems, though, is the hot trends vary with time. When I, I was a very young student, vacuum tubes were still important things. And I had some very strong interest in high power vacuum tubes. It was a good thing I was flexible, though, when I came to Stanford and I agreed to look at se semiconductors. <laughs> I'm a semiconductor guy. <laughs> <laughs> not a, a high-power vacuum tube guy, as a result of the reality distortion that Stanford gave me. It, and it was a good thing that I switched. But 
Semiconductors may not be what they once were. Vacuum tubes definitely aren't. And even clouds are passe now. We have to get beyond cloud. Now, for each of these new technologies, there is a, a, a domain of, of information stuff involved. Social networks are not the same as semiconductors. There are com commonalities in approaching a high-tech startup com company with all the different technologies. Techno there are commonalities, but there's also differences. Part of the way to succeed in a high-tech company in a specific domain is you have to know the landscape. You have to know the domain rules. This is abstract, and the uh, 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 challenge is that the domain rules vary in character and style for each of the domains as well. So just be aware, look at this slide, think about that a little bit. Each of these domains fit into some market segment. Just because you're doing a new cloud app doesn't mean you're going to com com uh, 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 compete with drug developers in their new developments. Each one of the technologies different people pursue have different parameters associated with that, different market sizes, different characteristics. There's a whole bunch of data to think about. You should look into all, all of that for whatever your choice is because sometimes you will find that the market size is not nearly as big historically as you might have thought it was. The market for wrist wa watches, for example, is not economically huge. Everyone has one, but they're a very low cost device and they don't, don't, people don't buy them yet. Every year, they buy a few in a lifetime. And so the market size for wrist watches, which, which without prior thought, you might have thought would be huge, is not as, as large as you might like it to be. It's also wise when, when you start to have a reasonable financial goal. Don't try and be Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates. Aim a lot lower than that and be happy because you're much more likely to succeed. Should you pursue venture capital funding? Probably, in my experience in this class, many if not most students coming into the class think that the most important step to forming a company is finding a venture capitalist. Probably that's not true. Lots of successful companies have been formed by students in this class with no venture cap capital, no angel funding, just a few fu fr funds from their parents or a visa card or something else. They they lived lean and low for a long time and, and succeeded. Your, your, your success with a venture capitalist will be very dependent upon exactly how your technology or approach fits into an existing and current hot, hot trend. If you're in one of these chosen hot trends, uh, uh, perhaps the VC can help you a lot. But for lots of companies, VCs can hurt as much as they help. <clears throat> the VCs are not always right. VCs are right about two out of 10 times. Uh, so of 10 groups of startup companies, they let down eight of them. Eight of them will, will not, not have above average returns. 
eight of them in five or ten years may, may regret some of the aspects of their VC experience. There, there's lots of uh, uh, secret information uh, uh, about the performance of VCs that's very hard to get. There's also some very public I information because some VCs have been invested in by some pension funds and such, and in those cases, the information is public. Uh, I'm not going to bore, bore you with this. Uh, I just uh, put a bunch of uh, stuff in about, about, about uh, 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 VCs and com companies, if you wish to look at them all on the slides, it's, it's there with references. One important thing to think about is how much is a company worth? I, you start a, a company, after three years of operation, you're doing almost a million bucks a year in sales, you feel that's an enormous success. How much is that worth? And, and when do you become a millionaire? Well, it's very hard to say how much a given company is worth. It's worth exactly what you can get someone to pay for it. There are things like price to earnings multiples, price to sales multiples, but you will find if you look across different marketplaces, they vary radically and they vary even radically company to company within a marketplace. Um, some com companies seem to command a very high va value for their company, and some don't. <clears throat> you may have heard all this information today. Uh, it may have been uh, a lot of information in a short period of time. And now the question is, how, how do you start? What, what do you do you do? You, you have to have an idea, and that idea has to be doable. You have to be able to do something to work toward that uh, idea. You have to be able to show the idea, not in words, but in demonstration to other people. The idea has to be able to be demoed. Most people won't care about your concept for a company until you have a demo for that concept. The uh, demoable idea has to somehow have a plan which goes to a level of business and sales. You have to have a workable plan to go from a demo to a solution. If, if your idea is to create a re replacement for gasoline, by ma making some hot hybrid plant, you have to know how to convert that plant in into a production level of gasoline. You, even though that plant may in theory be able to be converted because the equations or symbols are right, investors are going to wa want to know what are the, the concrete steps to convert a, a plant or a weed in, into gasoline. Do, do you need a pot or do you need a, a factory or exactly what do you need and how much of that has been demonstrated? If you need a, a, to, to, to build a huge weed refinery to turn a plant in the gasoline, that huge weed refinery may cost millions if not billions of dollars. You'll find it a lot more difficult to proceed with a workable uh, idea if it takes such a big investment to get to the next step. You need to have an idea that serves a human need. Like I, I have shown you and told you, uh, most companies fail because their idea 
doesn't serve a real need of real customers. Perhaps it, it in theory serves that, that need, but it's way, way too expensive to have something that costs $10,000 and people can't afford that price is irrelevant. It has to serve a human need. It, it has to be more than just a technological seed. There, there's also a different topic I would just like to briefly uh, go into, which is about scams. Uh, you probably are not, not aware of the, it, but there is a whole uh, host of criminals who are looking to pr play, prey on startup companies. There's all kinds of scams, worse than the Nigerian email scam, of, of what people out there are trying to do uh, to, to uh, defraud startup companies. And I made up this uh, word fool to help you remember that it, it's most important to at, at first create an uh, idea and a forecast for what uh, that I, idea becomes. Uh, that idea has to lead to your monopoly where you own a space. Uh, you own a marketplace, at least for a period of time. There has to be a, a way for that, that uh, uh, space or idea you, you, you work in to, to get out into the world. Uh, there has to be an opening to create a demand. Uh, uh, sometimes it's obvious and then sometimes uh, you have to have the world change a little bit to really adopt your idea. You have, have an idea for a, a smartphone app, but the smartphone hasn't been built yet. That, that app uh, re really needs to run with. So the screen is too small, or there's no way to put the information on the screen, or something do doesn't fit with today's devices, but it may be a long time before the devices uh, are available to allow your idea to prosper. And as I said, you are going to fail a bunch of times before you succeed, so you should learn from all of your failures. Your failures are not really failures. They're educational experiences. Education is expensive. You will learn to spend a lot on ed education. L look for things which can be, become very big and not uh, will, will peak out at a very low level. I wish you all to have good, good luck, but I warn you to be prepared. Remember that there's a need for speed, <laughs> and when in doubt, you should fire, fire, aim, <laughs> move quickly. Uh, you will need plan planning and hard, hard work. It, it will help you make your own luck. Remember that you come from a school with lots of uh, fa famous people who went out and did things that really did succeed. A bunch of you are going to be successful, not all of you. But even those who succeed may fail a bunch of times before they succeed. Thank you.